Hello, and in this tutorial, we're going to continue our discussion of linear regression models, and we're going to cover a concept called goodness of fit. And really, what we mean by goodness of fit is how closely our model actually fits the actual data. So the predictions that come out of our model, how close do they come to the actual values of the dependent variable that we're trying to predict? So let's keep moving forward. And we're going to start out this tutorial the same as in the previous tutorial where we're going to load data. So our data comes from um, a textbook called The Principles of Econometrics. It's from the fifth edition. And if you go to this um, link right here, you can get um, information on all the data sets within that textbook. Now, um, I have this set up as a CSV file, and we're going to load this as a CSV file. In the previous tutorial, we talked about how what what this command is doing and so i'm not going to go on about that here uh, i'll continue on we have we're storing and we're estimating a linear model and we're going to store that in an object called mod one and here we have the the basic syntax that we have our uh, dependent variable or our y variable um, first then we have a tilde and then we have our independent variables or our predictor or explanatory variables. In this case, we're talking about simple, um, you know, a simple univariate regression. And so there's only one of them. Okay, and then finally, we're going to indicate what data frame we want the um, model to pull the data from. And in this case, we already created a data frame called food. Okay, so same basic setup that we had in the previous tutorial. All right, so let's talk a little bit about R squared. R squared is both um, loved and reviled. So um, really basically what you need to do is you need to know what R squared is and then how to use it. Um, and so first of all, R squared is defined as the proportion of the variance in Y that is explained by the regression to the total variation in Y. Okay, I got a graph that we'll go and we'll look at that in just a second. I'll try to make that a little bit more clear. But for right now, let's think about this. Well, where do we find that in our R output? Well, in many statistic packages, R included, it's going to be labeled as multiple R squared. Um, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what the multiple is. It is, well, R squared. Um, and let's take a little bit more a graphical look at what R squared is. Okay, so well, before we do, we come down here and we can look at our regression output from the model that we estimated at the, at the initial setup. And we have here is our multiple R squared, and this is the actual R squared. Another statistic that gets reported a lot is called the adjusted R squared. I'm going to make an argument that it's not my favorite statistic in the world to use. Um, that I think it gets a little bit misinterpreted, especially in many textbooks. But um, it's 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 also a measure. It's often billed as a measure of goodness of fit, and I would argue that it is not. It's actually a model selection criteria. It's just not a very good one. So we'll keep moving forward. Okay, so let's talk about what R squared is. So we have this graph. And on here, first of all, we have our Y variable and we have our X variable. So in this case, this is going to be food expenditure. All right, just like what we have. And then X is gonna be income. All right, and we are trying to predict what food expenditure will be given a certain level of income. Okay, easy peasy. We have this blue line here. This is our regression equation that we estimated. And we can go back and look at that model to find out what beta one and beta two is, or in this case, B1, B2, what their estimates are, all right? And that gives us this blue line. So this would be um, B1 and the slope would be B2, all right? Easy peasy. So we have that so far. Now, what's going on? Well, I have a point and there's, and this is, Something you could prove using um, using um, algebra, algebra and calculus. You can prove that on every single linear regression line, they're always going to pass through this point. Oops. All right, x bar, y bar. 
all right? It just always happens, it doesn't really matter. We're not gonna go through that proof right now, but what's the important point is this is Y bar, all right? In other words, this is the unconditional average of Y. So, you know, basically I take all of my Ys, so one over N times the sum uh, from I equal one to N of Y I, all right? It's the arithmetic mean, nothing fancy there, okay? That's all it is, it's just the average of, in some, some um, some um, regression um, packages will actually output the average of the dependent variable. And that's what that is, okay? So we have, we're gonna take an arbitrary point and I need to change my color here. I'm gonna change it to red for right now. Um, and we have an arbitrary point that we've picked that's on the line. So this is a particular X, so XI, and a particular Y hat. In other words, it's what we would predict, it's what our model predicts at X at XI. All right, what predicts Y is. And so this distance, there's a, this is what actually happens. All right, this XI, YI. So this is what we predicted. This is what happens. This difference is the unexplained component or the residual. All right, so these, when we talk about residuals, that's what this is. This part is the total variation from the mean or from Y bar. And this part is how much variation we explain. And so roughly speaking, R squared is the ratio of this part we've explained to this total variation from the mean. That's what's going on with this R squared. Now I know there's a lot going on there, but basically you can think of it like this. If R squared is 0.38, I think that's close to what we had, I'm not sure, all right? Or sometimes you might say 38%. You could say on average, using this model will get you 38% closer to the actual value than just picking Y bar. All right, that's what we mean by this goodness of fit. How much closer will you be to the true value if you use this, this, this function, all right, this, this regression equation to predict your output than you would have been if you had just taken the average of the dependent variable, all right? And this average of this un, um, independent variable or dependent variable is what we call the unconditional mean of that because this, um, this blue line actually, represents a conditional mean, all right? The average value of Y, or at the our estimate of the average value of Y given a particular value of X, okay? All right, if you've got more questions about that, you know where to find me, make an appointment, and we'll talk it over more. Okay, so some warnings about R squared. First of all, R squared is, not the only measure of goodness of fits, nor is it a sufficient measure. We're gonna show an example here in a minute of four different data sets, all of which yield identical regressions with identical R squares. One of which the linear model is a good fit, all of the rest of them, it's absolute crap. So we're, we're gonna look at an example like this where we realize, no, just looking at R squared isn't enough. Two, it's a useful statistic, but it has some limitations. Namely, R squared is increasing in the number of parameters. So here's the thing. Let's say I have a Y and I have 100 observations of that Y. Now let's say I estimate, I, I um, simulate or generate 100 random X's. I just pick 100. In fact, I don't even have to pick 100. I pick 99 because I got a constant too. Right? If I do that, I can get an R squared of 100, of, of 1 or 100%. Explain it all. All right. I mean, it'd be massive overfitting um, and it would be a really totally crap model, but I could do that. 
And in fact, we see this, especially in some of these hyperparameterized models like you see in machine learning, um, that overfitting is a major problem. Well, we can have the same problem in traditional methodologies um, and particularly in these linear methodologies because you know, we, could just, we could just add more and more terms. In fact, we don't even have to add significant terms. We could add completely random ones. If we add enough of them, we can jack that R squared up to where it's, you know, quote unquote, perfect. So what should the R squared be? Well, the thing is about the R squared is it depends upon the signal to noise ratio. So if I have, let's say I have a relationship between X and Y that looks like this, but, and this is the true relationship, something like that line. So I know it's a linear relationship. I mean, that's what it is. But in reality, there's, there's error in my measurements. There's um, fiddliness in the universe. There's just weird things that cause there to be noise. And these dots, they roughly, the data points that we observe roughly fit around this line. And the relationship really is that what that line is, but there's just some noise in there. It's noisy. Um, you can get some static, so you don't see perfectly what that signal is. Well, if that signal to noise ratio is really, really high, you're going to have a high R squared. Got lots and lots of signal, good, strong signal, very low amount of noise, you have a high R squared. But if that signal to noise ratio is low, so you've got a lot of noise in the data and it makes it harder to see the um, signal, your R squared is going to be lower. And in fact, you want it to be because, and, and this goes to that idea of overfitting. Um, when you overfit, the problem with overfitting is, well, why don't we want just an R squared of 100? Well, the reason why we don't is because when you have noise in the data and you overfit it, what you're doing is you're building that noise into your model. And that will give you bad out of sample performance. You just won't, it won't fit very well. It looks like it fits, but it doesn't. Um, because what you really want to do is you want to filter out the static. And the best analogy I can think of like this is like a radio. So I've got my radio here, okay. And you know, I'm old, so I got a couple of dials here. I got this little analog thing and this thing and I turn it around. So this is the volume, this is the change or the frequency. You turn this little knob here, moves this guy over and we tune in the radio say, okay, yeah, none of you know what that is because that's like from, I don't know, almost before I was born. So in any event, we got a radio. What's coming in? Well, we've got the whole EM spectrum, all right? The whole electromagnetic spectrum coming into the antenna of this radio. But we really don't want the whole EM spectrum. All we want is our, you know, 94.278 oldies FM, whatever it is, okay? You know, or the 102 punk metal ska, or I don't know. Whatever it is you want, you want your radio station. Well, if you think about it, your radio has a has a, a very, very small R squared. I mean, the R squared is tiny. It's still what you want though, because it's filtered out all the noise, all right? It's giving you one frequency out of, well, first of all, if I just look at the radio frequencies, I mean, here in where, um, where I live in, in Wisconsin, with, just within the range of my house, there's like 40 different radio stations. Well, I don't want to hear all 40 of them at the same time. I want to filter them out and only get the one that I want, right? I don't know which one it is. I don't think that's a real radio frequency. At least I hope it's not. In any event, um, right, it's filtering that down. And it depends upon what R squared should be is, well, pretty much what it should be. Um, and it really comes down to that signal to noise ratio. Um, there are actually fields where R squared is used a little bit as a diagnostic. In other words, if it's too high, we call BS on the model. Um, you know, uh, particularly in time series, if you have an R squared that's over 9, 0.95, it's kind of, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Um, and we figure something weird is going on and want to double check everything. Um, there are other things when you start looking at, say, cross-sectional stuff, when we look at, um, um, say, you wanted to look at the current population survey data, where you have lots and lots and lots of individuals, tons and tons of noise. You may have 
single digit R squared. And that's perfectly acceptable because the, the noise, it's just such noisy data. Um, so really, I think that's my, my overall takeaway with R squared. So what about adjusted R squared? Well, adjusted R squared attempts to fix the problem of R squared being increasing in the number of parameters by, and yes, I know, I, I sorry, I only misspelling. L E S S and still, uh, uh, no, you know, any of it. Okay, by, for adding less statistically significant um, independent variables. All right, less, so it's not, sometimes the penalty is even there, even if you, if they're significant, it's just they're not as significant as quite what's needed for adjusted R squared. In, in some sense, I think it's a little bit arbitrary. And frankly, what happens is when you add this penalty in, you cease to be a measure of goodness of fit. It, it's now a model selection criteria. The problem with it is a model selection criteria is there are better ones out there, All right? That's, that's my big beef with it, okay? And so really adjusted R squared is not this measure of goodness of fit. The model selection criteria, it's just not the best one. Um, moreover, either R squared or adjusted R squared is not a substitute for some of the other model evaluation criteria we've got to go through. Like for example, plotting the data. And we're gonna look at a very famous one called Anscombe's Quartet. Um, Anscombe's Quartet is this great data set. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show it to you real quick. And let's just look at this. Okay, so you can, this is actually a built-in data set in R. You can just type in data add scum and, it, and it's built in. All right, so it's, it's very, very, it's been around a very long time. I think we developed this in the 1970s. There's not very many observations, so it's just 11, but it's designed very specifically. All right, so we have X, Y pairs. So X1 pairs with Y1, X2 pairs with Y2 and so on and so forth. You notice, that for all of, the, all of them, there's 11 observations. For all of the Xs, their means are nine. Their standard deviations are approximately 3.3 and 2.0. Oh, you know, you can see the means and whatnot. They're very, very close to one another. Not exact, but they're very, very close. And the standard errors on these are almost, uh, of the mean are almost identical. So basically the summary statistics for each of the Xs are almost identical. And the summary statistics for each of the Ys are almost identical. Moreover, if I regress X1 on Y or on Y1, or I, I use Y1 as the dependent variable and X1 as the independent variable, for each one of these, for X1, Y1, I'm going to get the, basically the same regression equation. I'm also going to get the same exact R squared. It's actually pretty cool. I mean, he did, he did, Enscom did this in a time a lo long before we had the computing power that we have at our, our disposal today. Um, I believe it was back in the early 70s when we developed this. He basically developed it because he was annoyed with his colleagues all thinking that all you had to do was look at the, look at the numbers. You never needed to plot the data. Um, and it turns out, well, you really do. Because if I look at, these are the, these are those four things. So here's y1 versus x1, y2 versus x2, and so on and so forth. For y1 and x1, the linear model makes sense. It looks good. I mean, this is, the, I mean, it, there's only 11 observations, so it's not perfect. Um, but overall, it looks about as good as you can get for a linear relationship. But when I look at two, well, that's horrible, right? What's going on? Well, it's not a linear relationship. It's actually a quadratic relationship. And three, well, I've got this really, really tight linear relationship with this big outlier. And this big outlier has leverage over the relationship. And you can see how much bigger influence that, that observation is having relative to all the rest of the observations. And so we kind of have this undo thing here. And then this final one, plot four, is just a freaking mess. I mean, it's just not, I mean, what, one might say that we have a, an outlier that has high leverage 
um, or it's you know it's it's having a high degree of influence over where this blue line is. I would say it's not even that. I'd say it's just a freaking mess um, because what you have is you have all of these x variables that are varying. I mean, you basically have two observations, uh, one over here and one over here. You don't have the full 11 observations. It's just weird. There's not enough variation in X to figure out if there is any relationship or not. Um, I guess there probably is not, but still, it's just you know basically awful. Um, and so we can see, of course, we don't want to just look at, at R squared to look at our goodness of fit. I mean, one really basic thing is we've already seen some residual plots. We need to look at those. We also need to just plot the data in any way that we can to make sure of this fit. Okay, great job. That's our coverage of goodness of fit. We will come back to this subject on multiple occasions throughout the semester.